please give a big welcome to Tommy Chuck. No standing ovations, please. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction. And uh, yeah, they keep reminding me that I did get busted <laughs> by the DEA. It was so unreal that I almost uh, it didn't exist anymore. You know, it doesn't exist anymore because that was two years ago. And uh, I've been out of jail, off probation for one one year, out of jail for two years. And uh, hey, shut that kid up! <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. It's probably one of mine. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I wrote a book, and uh, I'm having the most fun I've ever had in my life because I'm going on these Fox Network shows, and they're 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 actually inviting me on and they're asking me these loaded questions like uh, well you broke the law don't you think you should go to jail and then they sit there and watch me talk for the next 15 minutes because because i know how to filibuster <laughs> i don't give them a chance to answer back and i tell them you know how illegal and how corrupt this administration is but right now And basically how stupid they are, because they really are a, a stupid bunch of people, and ignorant, and they're scary because they've shown us that there are quite a few stupid people that believe in them, enough to vote for them. And what they've been doing, and what they've been doing for the last two elections, besides stealing the election, They've been, uh, you know, telling lies and, and, and just demonizing. Because what we're up against with these people, they're so-called Christian, uh, right-wing Christian, uh, uh, what do you call them? Whatever you want to call them. I call them Nazis. You know, fascist. Because that's what they really are. Fascism is when the government supports the corporate world. And that's exactly what these people have been doing, They're, they are doing. They're on the titty of big money in America, and have been. And big, not only in America, but if you've seen uh, Michael Moore's movie, uh, you know, where the Bush and the, the Bin Laden family and uh, the Saudis are all in bed with each other. And this is the people that are really running our country. In fact, if you remember back, they, they were going to give the the Saudis or, or some Arabs control of our ports but uh, it almost happened it came very close but not to worry because these aren't the same you know terrorists that attacked us these are friendly guys that actually own the country so so it really makes you wonder you know if that terrorist attack was really uh, a terrorist attack or was it set up by these corporate people because apparently these guys will go to any any lanes to get in power and to take all the money they can they're pirates they've, they've abducted this country and and they've been raping it and pillaging it ever since they've been in power and lie after lie after lie and all we can do is sit there and, and look at them. And me, in my case, I sat in jail and looked at them. And my only crime, really, was uh, I was just, you know, so tied up in my life. I was a pot comedian. And all I wanted to do, really, was smoke pot and tell jokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was a, it was a perfect life. I enjoyed it. And, and I wasn't... I, I didn't want to be an activist. I didn't want to do that marijuana march because marijuana and march don't really go together. Really. <laughs> but that was my crime. That was a crime I committed to myself, basically. Because while I was blissfully smoking my weed and telling my jokes, the Bush administration and the Republican Party 
were systematically taken apart our country, our freedoms, our way of life, the, our constitution. They were ripping it apart and they were selling it. They were just taking, taking us back, back to McCarthyism, even back further. And, and under the guise of all these stupid laws that they, they snuck in, they snuck in all these laws, you know, the, the, the pot law that they busted me on, the, the head of the narcotics in Los Angeles didn't even know that this law existed. We, they were so shocked after the DEA had busted us and, and, and taken, you know, my money and my, you know, out of my house and taken the computers and the bombs. Our lawyers went to the head of the narcotics in Los Angeles and they together, they, they had to look up the statute to find out what law I broke because it was a law that was never enforced in California. It was only enforced in two states, Pennsylvania, the home of the DEA, and Ohio, the home of idiots, <laughs> Republican idiots. And what they did, they, they, they blindsided me and to the point where I really technically never broke any law. They, uh, that's why they had to threaten my wife and my son with imprisonment. <clears throat> Which is, and that was why I pled guilty. Because I intended to, to plead not guilty. I wanted to go to court. I wanted to stand up and, and make them prove how a glass could be a threat to anybody's health or to be illegal in any way. A glass pipe that w at once, you know, I, I, I had an art show uh, prior to my arrest where I displayed the glass pipes and the DEA, they were undercover and they were there filming it. And so that would have been evidence for me to prove that the pipes weren't only for tobacco use only, but they were also protected under the art umbrella and uh, I never had a chance because they, they told me if I didn't plead guilty they would go after my son and my wife now my son he could have done the time you know but I couldn't envision me visiting my wife in jail for something that I did <laughs> I would sooner get the death penalty because, you know, that wouldn't be fair, and I would never do it. And, they, and the government knew that. And so I had to stand in front of a judge and, and, and agree with everything that they said. And, and they made me perjure myself while I was standing there. They said, because what they do, they ask you a lot of questions and you answer yes to them. You know, you are guilty, yes, so on. And they said, you are the sole owner of Chong Glass. And that was a lie. And so I said, no, I'm not. And then they stopped the court proceedings and then my lawyer and the judge got together and they took a, 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 a pen and just rubbed out my answer and put in uh, yes I am instead of saying no they just put in yes so it's a you know it was perjury all the way anyway I ended up going to jail and uh, the first the first half hour in jail was my worst I um, I got claustrophobia it was uh, a horrible, horrible feeling because all of a sudden I, I could hear the doors slamming shut. And I could hear the locks turning. And I, I started sweating and I started almost shaking. And I, I came close to having a panic attack because I went from, you know, being free as a, a, as a bird to being locked in a, in, in a cage with all these other people, all these men. And then... I had no choice but to kind of go within because there was nowhere else I could go. I was locked up. And I went inside of my being and I kind of reverted back to, to my childhood when I was very, very young. I, I, I learned the power of prayer. I went to a, a Bible camp and they used to teach us how to pray. And it was a beautiful, beautiful experience. And I learned how to pray. And I learned how to, what to ask for. 
And when, when I, it's in my book, when, when you pray, you ask for understanding and wisdom. That's all you need. And I did that. I did that. It was a, it was a, a cry. Help, help me understand this. And then a warm, a warm feeling came over me. And that warm feeling stayed with me the entire time. The warm feeling was like a, it was like a, just a warm af affirmation. It, it felt like something was telling me, this is, is what it's all about. This is what your life has come to, and this is, there's a meaning here that defies logic at the time, but you will see in time that you needed to be reconnected with me. And it was myself talking to myself. It was the higher self talking to you and calming all the fears. And, and I realized after I was there long enough, because that feeling never left me, then I started studying. I started studying the Bible. And I started studying uh, this uh, religious book called, um, written by Joel Goldsmith. And then I got a hold of the I Ching. I just reached out for every bit of literature I could find on the, the spiritual side. And it's not nothing to do with religion. It was all about spirituality. It was all about meditation. I started to meditate. And the meditation wasn't just the Buddha style, which was where you sit and think of nothing. I meditated Goldsmith style, where I sat and listened for God. And for people that are uncomfortable with the word God, I learned from the Bible that all you have to do is substitute the word love for God. It's the same thing. And that's what I did. And so, thank you. And so I, so I, and I realized that that warm feeling that I felt inside of me was what we are all basically comprised of. Pure love. And pure love will survive, heal everything. You can, it, it will, dispel any fear that you have all you have to do is just go to that spot and that's what I did the fear is melted away and then with love came the knowledge of why I was and am a comedian because you can't love and not laugh at the same time it's impossible it's a realization that, that when you realize how much love there is inside of you, that realization makes you laugh because it's, it's a joyful realization. And that's what comedians do. That's what we do. As comedians, what we do, we find truth. And when we find truth, we find the funny part of that truth. And when I was with a band, when I was with a, a black band years ago, and we were touring the South, and we were running into all sorts of prejudice and hate and anger with these white southerners when, when we would run into these th these emotions it would be funny to us we look at each other and maybe one of us would get mad but the other ones would be laughing at how stupid these people are and how great look at look at how funny they look look at their face when they get all anger anger and you know and, and well, why are they mad man i mean it was we were laughing so hard at the end we i i swear to god man i almost got shot one time i i i, I was in a store and and this old bum was asking the, the white guy behind the counter he said uh, if, if it was okay if he could sleep in in a parked car or something like that and uh, I was in there with my, my, my black buddies. We were going to buy something for the road. And it was so funny. It was so cute how this old bum was asking this guy that I started smiling. <laughs> and the guy behind the counter, he, he thought we were there to rob him or something. <laughs> he, he reached under and got his gun, man. <laughs> and he's like, hey, what are you laughing at, boy? <laughs> and, he, you know, he, he had about... 
three teeth. You know, <laughs> they were kind of spaced on either side of his mouth. You know. That made me laugh. And, and so then I guess he thought we were hopped up on some kind of drug or something. <laughs> And my partners, they grabbed me and they said, come on, man, get the hell out of here. Man. You're going to get us killed, bro. <laughs> so I laughed, but that's, that's how we survived. That's how, Cheech and I, that's how we, we, we survived for, in, in, in this world, you know. I mean, here we are, two guys, you know, and we got a Chicano and a, and a stoner. And, 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 and we're doing concerts for 30,000 people where comedians could, would die. But Cheech and Chong, I mean, we were just, we, we were some other kind of entity, you know, we weren't just comedians, we were in a band, we were like, we were the people that we were entertaining. And, and it was all laughter, it was all beautiful, it was all love. And even our movies, and, and they put me in jail, when they put me in jail, they had me, they stood me up in front of the, the, the court, and they said, uh, the reason I should go to jail is that I made mo I made millions of dollars making movies that glorified drugs and made fun of law enforcement agencies. I mean, isn't that yeah? Isn't that what America is about? Being able to speak, you know. Now I don't know about glorifying drugs. I don't know if glorifying a herb that helps people when they have MS. If that's bad, you know, glorifying a drug that helps people with cancer or people with AIDS, it helps keep people alive, is, is that bad? No, no, of course not. No, no. And, and the fact is, the pot that we talked about, it, was, it wasn't drugs. And not only that, and, and not, not defending ourselves, but, you know, in Up and Smoke, I took a handful of pills. I've been, you know, I didn't even know what they were. Acid, powders, it was everything. And I, I, I sure, it certainly wasn't glorifying anybody. I was falling on my ass, you know? <laughs> and being arrested, you know? I mean, the, if that's glorifying drugs, then, you know, I'm sorry, then Arnold Schwarzenegger is glorifying killing when he kills all those people uh, with, as, as a Terminator. So it, it's make-believe, and these guys couldn't believe this is a fucking movie. I'm an actor. And the judge looked at me. He thought I was a stoner. He, he said, okay, I, I really want to hear from Mr. Chong. I guess he thought I was going to stand up and go, uh, your honor, man. Uh, it, no, I stood up there and I was more articulate than my lawyer. My lawyer, he... he he couldn't talk. He was so nervous because my lawyer knew I was going to jail. Everybody, all the legal people knew I was going to jail. They pretended to me, you know, that, oh, well, you might get house arrest. And, you know, and, and when you're a defendant, you always, you're always holding out hope. You don't believe this is going to happen to you. It, it can happen to you, you know. I mean, like Martha Stewart, when she went to jail, I know that she's thinking, what are they thinking, you know? <laughs> Look at me, I'm Martha Stewart, and I, yeah, I might have lied, but I mean, jail? But on the upside, now when I'm on Fox TV or any of the, the stations, they ask me, what kind of jail was it? I says, it was exactly the kind of jail they're building for Republicans. <laughs> you know the ones they built for Watergate? Remember Nixon and Halderman and all those criminals when they went to jail? Those Republicans that went to jail, well, this is the same jail I was in, and they're, they're making it bigger because you, you got guys like uh, uh, Abramoff and DeLay and, and uh, all these criminals, you know, and, and uh, you know, the Enron people, all these Bushies, they're going to jail, you know. And, and so I, I turn it around now, and, and I realize, because when I was sent, standing up there being sentenced, I heard that voice again. And it kept going over and over again. And like I said in my book, thy will be done. Thy will be done. And that was comforting to me. Because what was happening to me wasn't what Bush and them were doing to me. It was what the cosmos, what the sage, what the higher power was sending me on a mission. And I'm in that mission right now. I'm on that mission right now.
I'm talking to everybody that I can talk to. I'm on television. I'm selling a book. I'm everywhere. Tell them what assholes Bush and the boys are. Uh, and I never... I'll be like Cher in her farewell tour, man. It's not going to end. You know, because he even said to me, aren't you over that yet? I said, no. No, because, you know, I started counting up how much money I lost when they put me in jail. Cheech and I had two movie offers. That's five million bucks there. And we had a television show. I, I was on that 70s show. I, you know, there was a lot of per personal appearances. They, they, they've taken me for about five, you know, close to eight, eight million dollars in lost wages. And see what they think. They're putting an old stoner, all I'd ever do, because you see in the movies that I do get high and play music, and uh, what's the difference? He's going to just get high and sit in the jail. And by the way, you know what they did? Every time, I, every, when I was in jail, I wasn't in there a week before people were offering me uh, pot. <laughs> pot. The only problem was, it was snitches from the government. They were trying to get me to smoke so they could bust me, so they could have the headline, Oh, Chong got busted smoking dope in jail. But I fooled them all, man. I quit. I quit two weeks. I quit before I went to jail. I quit during while I was in jail. And I stayed clean all the time up to now. Except, I'll tell you the truth, I was in Canada. I got off probation. I lit up just for a celebration and talk, you know. Yeah, I did it, man. And what I learned, you know, and that's another thing, and people, you know, these right wing guys say, well, why did you quit smoking dope? You know, they're looking for some kind of remorse, some kind of, you know, that I'm going to say, well, uh, you know, I learned my lesson and I'm sorry, you know. I told them, I quit smoking dope to, just to show you idiots that it's not addicting. It's not addicting. And the only reason it's illegal, it is illegal, one of the, if, if pot was addicting, it wouldn't be illegal because then somebody like the tobacco companies could control it and then they could sell it like the drug pushers they are you know and same, same as the, uh, the the medicine that's why the pharmaceutical companies they don't want pot legal they can't afford pot being legal and not only the pharmaceutical companies but you take all these societies that you know like the cancer society the, the heart society all these societies that make money as long as this is a disease that can't be cured, they'll always be asking you for money to support their cause where they're looking for a cure. Well, the truth is, there's been a cure for cancer for years. There's been a cure for MS for years. And it's been suppressed by the, this government of ours, by the pharmaceutical companies that make millions and millions, billions of dollars selling us their uh, medicines that only help the symptoms and not even that it kills more people than it helps all these me medicines and 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 these are, this is stuff that the government and the media which is the same thing by the way you know for the most part you know it's it's controlled this this government is controlling the media because when i was busted fox news was there you know and fox news was there long before my lawyer got there you know, Fox News was sitting there, and the helic helicopters were hovering above. And this is, they're busting a guy, me, for shipping bombs. Now, when we were in California, we went to the, the license department. We got a license. We told them exactly what we were making, bombs. We were making glass pipes. They gave us a license. They took our money. We got our tax number. We were paying taxes. We were totally legal in every sense of the word. And the only reason we got busted was because the DEA set up a phony head shop in Pennsylvania and they had to, they begged our company to send the bonds to them and we wouldn't do it. They had to finally fly to LA, put an undercover agent in, in the company and then finally the bonds were sent, the law was broken. And, and for that, you know, here I am now. But there again, you know, this is the outrage that I felt. I felt. While I was in jail, by the way, while I was, yeah, I was in trapping all the way, but while I was in jail, I felt embarrassed. I was embarrassed because I'm all huffing, puffing about my case. And then all of a sudden I'm talking to people that had been in jail for 30 years. 
for ha uh, growing pot and having a pellet gun beside the bed when they were busted. They were, they were, the worst case was this, there was two uh, uh, Mexican nationalists from, you know, uh, the workers, you know, day workers that were standing by uh, a Home Depot and the DEA picked them up and uh, paid them like a hundred bucks, you know, we're going to work you for the day. And the DEA took them and they dressed them in suits and then they handed them a, a, a pound of cocaine to hold, pose for a picture. Then they busted them. And they had kept them in jail. And they were in jail for three years before they learned enough English to tell their story. And they finally got out. But they were in jail for three years. This is, this is, the, this is what we're up against. This is the DEA. This is the government, government sting. And this is just one story. One story. While I was there... A prisoner died from neglect, pure neglect. He had what they call valley fever. And when you're in jail in, in the desert, apparently you get this valley fever. They don't know what it is. It just comes up when the wind comes up. It could be the fact that the jail is built over top of an old oil well site, you know, where they dump everything in the ground. And so when, this, when this, the wind comes around and, and you get valley fever, it's it's like AIDS. You, you you drop your weight, and and you drop enough weight, you die. And many people have died from from this valley fever. While I was in jail, there was one prisoner that was so sick he couldn't get out of his bed, and no one would come and help him. And so he finally, the day before he died, he he managed to crawl out of his bed, and and so they put him in a wheelchair, and the prisoners themselves took him over to the infirmary, and he died that night and they cremated them the next day. So there wouldn't be any autopsy. And then all they did was send his family a notice saying, uh, your son died, sorry, and he's cremated, you come and get the, uh, the remains, and that, that's it. That's because he was in the, the penal system. The federal government's penal system, by the way, is another thing that I learned there. It's the, jails that I, the jail I was in, and the jails across the country that Martha's in, they're all privately owned by a company in, I think, in Denmark. It was called Wackenhut for a while, and now it's called Geo. They keep changing the name so it makes it harder for people to, to sue them for wrongful arrest. While I was in jail, there were many, many guys in there hoping for appeals. And forget it. One guy appealed successfully, and he's still in jail because the jail just choose to uh, ignore the court order. They have that power. So, on the bright side, on the bright side, there is a bright side to all this. Is that's the same system that's going to be prosecuting the Bush administration when his ass is out of jail. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because you count him. He's committed so many crimes. Him and his guys have committed so many crimes. And, you know, they talk about the axes of evil. There's Bush, Cheney, and Rumsfeld. I call them the axes of feeble. Because every one of them, you, you can see every one of them have, have a substance abuse problem. I believe, well, we know Cheney is a drunk. We know that. He, I mean, he got so drunk he shot his best friend in the face. And it took him 24 hours to sober up. <laughs> and he said, oh, it was an accident. Well, then why did it take us 24 hours to hear about this accident? Could it be they couldn't sober the fucker up? <laughs> and even when they sobered him up, they still couldn't get his story straight. Everybody else said that they only had Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Except Cheney, he kept saying, I had one beer. <laughs> That's a drunk for you, man. He's an alcoholic. Rumsfeld, I don't know what he's on. Probably downers, you know. Because he keeps talking to himself, you know. Are we doing good in Iraq? No, but we're going to get better. Should we have more troops in Iraq? Yes, we should, but we don't have them. He talks to himself. And then Bush, Jr., 
This guy, no, he really, when I get money from this book, I swear to God, I'm going to start a foundation called No President Left Behind. <laughs> I make a pledge right now, I'm going to hire the best grade four teachers in the country to teach this idiot another syllable. Because even when 9-11 happened, if you remember when, when in that movie, Bush was sitting there and uh, reading to the kids, I think they were reading to him. <laughs> he, he was sitting there looking at that book and they told him, you know, the, the plane scratched in and he kept staring at the book. Probably sounding out the word. Stoop, stupid. <laughs> this guy is, and I think, uh, personally, I think that what he, his problem is, more than likely, methamphetamine. He's a tweaker. You know what tweakers are? Tweakers are, they, they, get, they get high on meth, and the first thing they want to do is take something apart. Yeah. They'll take apart their bike, usually it's their motorcycle, they'll take that apart. And then they'll put it back together, they'll have five boxes of parts left over. Bush? He's taking this country apart. And Bush will never put it back together again, man. Never. Never. He won't be in office that long. Because I swear to God, man, if we don't get this guy out of office, and this is our chance now, it's coming up. I mean, he can't, the only thing he can do now, really, I mean, what can he do that's been more stupid than what he's been doing? There's nothing. There's nothing. And, it's, and, and I think the problem with Bush was his dad was a cokehead. And the reason I know that, I, I'm, I'm talking from, I, I know a lot of things, man. I, I was watching the debate between Bush Sr. and Clinton. If you get a chance, go back and look at it. They asked both those guys, they said, what do you think about the drug war? And when they said that, Bush Sr. did this. That's an international sign that, uh, do I have coke on my mustache? <laughs> the only thing he didn't do was this. <laughs> of course he's a cokehead. He's skinny, look at him. You know, at that age you should be a big fat tub, you know, like Rumsfeld, the rest of the boys. But, George Sr., man, he's, you know, and he's nervous, too, you know, him. George Jr.'s got that little coke thing, you know, <laughs> you see him up there, he, he can't stay, you know, he can't, and he can't think properly either, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, <laughs> don't fool me twice, <laughs> not nice to fool me. the decider, the decider. Well, when Bubba gets ass in jail, he'll be the decider on that. He'll be saying, hey, what part do you want, boy? <laughs> and it's coming, man. It's coming because I, I maybe I'm a fantasized, but the thing, the thing that the I Ching taught me is that the I Ching itself is a book of changes. The I Ching says the only thing constant in this universe is change. And so what goes up must come down what goes around comes around for every action there's a reaction and for all the bullshit that George Bush and the boys have put us through he's going to get it back and karma is unrelenting it's unrelenting you can't escape it it's impossible to escape unless unless you break the cycle and become enlightened now the chances of that I mean, it's happened, it's happened, you know, it could happen to anybody. Because just like when Jesus, oh, that's another thing, Mel, they talk about pot, how bad pot is. He put me in jail nine months for pot, basically. Now, Mel Gibson. You see how evil alcohol is, man? Alcohol and karma. Here, Mel, Mel made $600 million dollars making a movie about a Jew that got beat to death by a bunch of Romans and uh, angry mob and crucified and tortured. And what is the first thing Mel does when he gets drunk? 
starts talking bad shit about the Jews. Man. That's it. karma. It's karma. And the other thing, Mel, think about it. If Mel Gibson had been stoned on pot, oh, he would have got stopped all right. But it, it would have been for driving too slow. <laughs> so we have to, what we have to do, what I'm doing now is, I, I, I got off my butt. I quit smoking pot, and I'm going to stay clean until, until, uh, I, unless I get MS, then I'm going to start smoking again. <laughs> Or cancer, or, or, if I'm going to stay clean until and st st keep talking until we get a change, a proper change in our government, and 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 I'm going to make sure you know that 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 we look at all the details, you know, because I I love Al Gore and I love his movie and I love what he stands for and everything else, but he didn't fight hard enough for his when when they stole the election. You know, there, there, there could have been a lot more done, you know, because they, out, out, in, uh, Ohio, they, they, in Ohio, they had a, a town, 500 people had 3,000 votes. It's true. True. And, and the voting machines were late getting to these uh, black precincts or the Democratic precincts. And they, the lineups uh, stretched until midnight and people got tired and they went home and they never voted. And, and that kind of stuff has been going on. And so what we have to do as, as, as concerned citizens, because I was asked, they said, if you don't like it here, why don't you go back to Canada? And I told them, fuck you, man. I'm an American. I'm American, man. I took a vow to uphold the Constitution. And the reason I love this country is because I can stand up here and talk and, and tell people what an idiot that we, idiots that we have running this government. And, and it's, it's not only a, a, a right, it's a duty. You know, because when you're on probation, for instance, if you see a crime and you don't report it, you violate your probation. And what they aim that for is, for me, is like if I smoke, see someone smoking dope or selling dope or something, and I don't report it, then I violate my probation. But they said crime. They didn't specify what kind of crime. And so... Actually, it's my duty as a citizen that I see these guys mess up the way they're messing up. And, and the DEA, who, who is a, it's a criminal organization, the DEA, by the way. Out and out criminal. I know personally, because I had a friend that was dealing uh, huge amounts of pot into, into America. And he got caught by the DEA. And they handcuffed him in front of the Grauman's Chinese Theater. And then they asked him where his safe house was, and he told them. And so they said, how much money is in there? They, they told them, well, half a million dollars. How much drugs? He says, about the same. So there's a million dollars, a half a million in cash, a million dollars in drugs. They took him down to the station, and about four hours later, they opened the door, and they took off his cuffs, and they said, get out of here. And never hit the paper, and never, he never was in charge with anything. He's up in Canada now. Gee, what happened to that half a million dollars in cash? Hmm. Let me think. Could it be that the DE agents are sat around and split it up amongst themselves? And then sold the drugs? And this is just one incident? So, come on, folks. This is what we're up against. And that's why people ask me, you know, what, what would you tell a pot? You know, someone that's growing pot. I'd say be very careful, man. Be very careful. There are snitches everywhere you look. There are people, they'll bust somebody and then they'll rat, they'll get him to rat someone else out, everything else. And they ask me, what do you do? I said, I don't sell any, I give it away. You know, if it comes my way, I give it away. I don't smoke it because it's, they, they're, these guys are serious and they're looking for an excuse to bust me, you, anybody. I mean, they have the jails, man. They have, they have the will. They have everything. And the best thing to do, that I found out to do, is to go to that spot, that space. By the way, that, that space, how, uh, this is how you get there. It, biblically speaking, it says, it shall be according to your faith. If you know that spot exists, and it does exist, then all you have to do is realize it. You don't have to do much more than just 
instantly realize that, that spot is there in everybody and you go there and you can stay as long as you want you can stay forever if you want because while you're there your your, your affairs will be taken care of it'll be through you but it will be by that power and so every answer you give will be the power's answer. Every, every decision you make will be made with that, that power. And a lot of decisions will be, well, let me think about it. Because a lot of decisions need to be thought about. And it's, it's called non-action. It's called resist, not evil. Don't give it any energy. That's why anger only begets more anger. Insults only beget, beget more insults. And that's the way it works. The only thing that, that trumps all that negative energy is the energy of love. The energy of love in it. And you don't have to say a word. You just have to go to that spot where that love exists. Because that's what you're all made of. Pure love, that's the essence of what we are. And always remember that, that darkness is only the absence of light. There is only light. There is no darkness. There is only good. There is no evil. Because evil is only the absence of good. And when there is evil, there is no good. And when there is no good, there is no God. So that's why wars happen. That's why crimes happen. Because... Where that evil is happening, there is no God. There is only darkness. And the only thing that cures that is light. And the only light that, that is real is from the source. And the source, every one of us has that light. Every living being on this planet has that light. Every molecule in this planet has that light. It is what we are. And the I Ching is based on the principle, it's called the binary system. The binary system is the same principle that we have, that our computers are made of. It's zero and one. And by the way, co coincidentally, that's the same system that our DNA is, zero and one. And so, what is zero? Infinity. What is one? You. Zero and one. There is only one. And that's us. Thank you. Take a few questions, and Tommy, if you could just uh, repeat the question. Just repeat the question. <laughs> the inmates. It's, it, the weirdest thing about going to jail, and, and you guys probably know what I'm talking about. If you ever drive by. <laughs> I mean, if you ever drive by, uh, a, you know, a road crew, yeah. you notice you don't look at their faces. You kind of almost look away. You, you, they're there, but you kind of ooh, because it's like, like by the grace of God, there, there, there I am, or there's my kid, or something. You know, if you have no one in jail, you don't look at them. If you have someone in jail, you kind of see if they're there. It's the same thing as before you go into jail, you're a citizen. But when you walk into that, it's like going into another dimension. As soon as I got into that dimension, I was one of them. And I was not only one of them, I was a famous one. So they loved me. I, I loved them. It's, it, it was a mutual thing. Everybody, by the way, the guards treated me well. You know, I mean, they looked at my butt a lot, but, you know. <laughs> they treated me well. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Is that? Oh, thank you. Thank you, dear. And so do you, by the way. You, you go. Yes, sir. You know, I've been trying to, we've been, Cheech and I, Cheech came out to the prison to visit me, but he only came one time. And I think he was a little nervous, because <laughs> he, know, he knows that you can get time off if you turn someone in. <laughs> he was afraid I was going to go, he, he did it, man. We've been trying to kind of get together, but Cheech is sort of on his own. He, he, he went 
the other path, you know, he went straight, you know, uh, the Herald or Don Johnson route, you know. And I, I, I always say this way, you know, Chief went back to his roots and I stayed with my buds. <laughs> so I don't think so. Is there any members of the original Shades? Yeah, yeah, there is. Uh, there's a few, there's a few around. There's, um, yeah, a couple of guys. Tommy Melton's, Tommy Melton's still around. Uh, Bernie. And my brother Stan, yeah, he's still there. Oh, you did? You had a crush on Stan. Oh, you're telling me that you had a crush on my brother, huh? I'm used to it. Now, I'd be up there playing and, and a girl would walk up, a real pretty girl, and hand me a note. And I'd read the note and say, give this to the drummer. <laughs> In the back, yeah. When you were prosecuted, uh, do you think that someone snitched you out? Like, why, why were you prosecuted and other head shops weren't prosecuted, like, on the internet and just say, like, down the street there's head shops that you can walk into and buy pipes or tobacco use? Well, it was very obvious that they wanted the... the Pope a pot, you know, they wanted Chong, and Cheech and Chong, you know. Uh, yeah, because, you know, they didn't care, they didn't, obviously, they didn't care about the, they, the guys, the, the glass blowers they put on house arrest, by the way, brought their equipment in the house and kept making glass. You know, they, they, what was the difference, you know, it would be a house arrest in the factory or a house arrest in the, in the house. Uh, no, no, it was pure, they're out to get me, and, and they got me. And now they're going to have to deal with me. <laughs> yes, sir. Is your company still going to be producing products? No. You mean uh, the glass company? No, no. Unfortunately, uh, part of the deal I signed with the government was that I would not uh, have, I would uh, dissolve Chong Glass. And, so I don't sell bongs anymore, but we do sell thongs. <laughs> and my face are on them, too. <laughs> And the beard be, fits right in nicely. <laughs> yes, ma'am. About um, your last few statements were rather profound, actually. And I wonder, did you come by that understanding gradually, or were there moments? Um, uh, it's something that, it's a knowledge that I've, I've always kept to myself. It's, a hard, it's hard to show, share enlightenment with people that are unenlightened. It's very hard. I mean, I mean, even in, in this room, I can. I know there's people here that are just looking at me, going, that, "That's not funny." <laughs> but then, you know, but that's the way it's always been, you know. And uh, I've always had those thoughts from the beginning, from forever. See, the the thing is, we have always been here, different sizes, different shapes, different bodies, but we have always been here. <laughs> People get confused with eternity and infinity. It's forever. So there's never been a middle, there's never been a beginning, never been an end. So you've always been here, you've always been here, I've always been here. It, but we can't know these things and function in whatever we're doing at the time. We, have, we all have our stuff to do. We all have our trips to do. We, we, we don't all have the luxury of, of, you know, meditating on a mountaintop, contemplating life, you know. But the realization of who you are has to come individually at your own time. And that's what happened to me. When I, got, when I was put in jail, that was, that was the kick in the butt that put me on the path. And, and that was a kick in the butt that's made me, uh, allowed me to speak up. Before that, I had no reason to. You know, it's like keep your religious beliefs to yourself. Now they've given me a chance and, a, and, and an opportunity to, to share with those. And, and so, so it's, we've always been here and we'll, we'll always be here. Yes, ma'am. Is it entrapment illegal? <laughs> oh yes, totally illegal, totally illegal. Everything, everything they did to me was blatantly, it was blatant. 
But look what they did to Iraq. I mean, they lied. They they lied. They told. They sat up and told a bald faced lie, and now they're doing the same thing with Iran. Now that because these people, they're arms dealers. You know, it's just like firecracker salesmen. You know, they need a Fourth of July every day, because the more bombs they blow up, the more they can build. And the more oil, you know, the more that you fight over oil, the higher oil prices go, and the more money they make. And the thing is, you get so greedy, you get so greedy that, that you lose sight of any kind of humanity. Look what happened to Enron, all the people in Enron. They were making millions and millions of dollars, and they were going, ah, more money, more money, more money, and then, they, then it all fell apart on them. And that's what happened. The oil, oil is a great example. Oh, oil prices are gone crazy. Okay, so what do we do? We drive electric cars. And we drive Ford. Ford's going out of business. Thanks to Toyota's electric car. And thanks to the rising oil prices. So everything happens. Every action, there's a reaction. And, and as greedy as the, these guys are, what good is it going to do? They're still going to die. You know? You can only... I heard a great thing. Um, the bigger the boat, the bigger the frown. And what that meant is, you go out in the boat, uh, you know, when you go boating, you look at the little kids in the little dinghy, they're laughing. You look at the guy in this little sailboat, they're smiling. You look at the guy on the big yacht, he's frowning. The bigger the boat, the bigger the frown. And that's what all these rich guys, all these oil guys, I mean, I, I know I, I know the Enron, uh, not Enron, but Exxon. I know the the girl, the daughter of the one of the vice presidents. I mean, they're worth so much money. He's got a mansion in Houston that he can't give away. He's trying to get his kids to live in it, and, and, and the girls up in Calgary going, "I don't want to live in that thing. It's big. Oh, it's ugly. I don't want to live there." You know, you get so much, you get that frown. You know. Because what do you do when you get wealth, you know? What did the, uh, the Indians, the uh, Canadian Indians, what they would do, they'd have potlatches. And when they got too much shit, they'd give it away. They'd get a party and say, okay, I'm too rich, okay, here, take it. Because all, what does wealth do? It holds you down, holds you down. It, 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 you drag it around, you're, you're counting your stuff. Oh, God, I, 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 didn't I have another car or something? You know what I mean? You know, and that's why when, when I was in jail, I was the freest guy. I was free. And, and the inmates there, if you're enlightened, you're, you're, you're not only free, you're, you're, oh man, we would, I'd be suntanning. And the guards would be walking around with, you know, all buttoned up, you know, and they're sweating. And, they, you know, they, they got their weapons and they're walking around, you know, and, they're, and I'm laying out there getting a the suntan. And I felt like saying, uh, excuse me, could you give me some 7-Up, please? <laughs> Rub a little oil on my back. Thank you. <laughs> Who's really in jail? No, no, no. Enlightenment. Enlightenment. When you're enlightened, when you have... That's what the prayer. When you pray for wisdom and understanding, you don't need anything else. The last thing I did when I was there, I, I, I joined the Indian Sweat Lodge. And the Indian Sweat Lodge is a beautiful... It was the Indian's religion. And they invited me, and they don't invite everybody, but they invited me, and they told me, and I didn't go right away because they told me, uh, okay, two rules, no homosexuality and no drugs. And I, I said, oh, w w why no homosexuality? <laughs> Just joking, of course. But that's, that's what people think, you know, they think, oh, sweat lodge, naked man, you know. But what it was, it was, it was incredible. The sweat lodge... It's a, it's a little hut, a nipi, it's about this big, and it's made out of uh, willows, and then they put, they cover like skins or canvas or plastic, whatever they got over it. Got a hole in the center where they put rocks that have been heating in the, in the fire pit for, for hours, and they're red hot, and you fall in on your hands and knees because the sweat lodge symbolizes the womb. And you're symbolically crawling on your hands and knees, being humble, crawling back into the womb. And when you get around there, they close the flap, and they start playing the drum. And they start chanting, like, hey, 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 
Lakota Indian chant songs, and the song goes and the drum goes, and, and I, I translated it, and it's sort of like, it's fucking hot in here. My balls are melting. I'm going to fucking die. It was so hot, man. It's pitch black, and I fell over. My body was just looking for air, anything, you know. And the heat, and they kept throwing water on the rocks. And it was, Oh fuck! It's hot, so hot. My my, I could feel my spirit leave my body, and my spirit said, "I'll be outside. Uh, stay, enjoy." And then after after about twenty minutes, they opened the flap and they said, "Anybody want to leave? You can leave." And I wanted to leave so bad, man. Oh, I just wanted, to, but I couldn't move. And so a lot of guys, they left, they got out of there, and I'm trying to go with him, and I couldn't move. And so he's like, oh, he's a warrior. Okay, close the flap. <laughs> Four flaps later, they couldn't stand it any longer. There was only the chief and the drunk left. They said, oh, it's too hot in here, John, we're out of here, man. Then, then, then they realized I was dead, you know. And they drug me out, you know, it was like coming out of a womb, too, you know, it was all wet, you know. But that was like a born-again experience, you know. And I couldn't wait to go back the next week, but I learned how to do it, you know, you wrap yourself with towels after, after they close the flap, you know. When you go in there, you're a real warrior, but as soon as they close the flap, it's dark, you wrap up with towels, and you get all ready, you know, find a little spot, you know, and then I did it. Okay, so, thanks again.